we are recording. Okay. So, good evening, officially. Uh, welcome to our second ever National Online Broadview Reading Club. Uh, my name is Jocelyn Bell, and I'm the editor and publisher of Broadview. And I'm so glad that you've taken an hour from your evening to be here with us tonight and take part in this Broadview community event. Um, just like last week if you were here, but if you weren't, that's okay. The program is going to be straightforward. We have uh, four writers from our June issue with us tonight. Um, and one of them is just going to be appearing not on video, but on phone because of internet issues. Um, and so we've got with us Kevin Spurgaitis, uh, Judith Pedersen, Mike Alexander, and Al Alison Roberts McEwen. And they have graciously offered their time for this event. So I'll introduce them uh, each in turn and each writer will speak about their story for about five minutes. And then you'll have about seven or eight minutes to ask questions before we need to move along to the next person. Um, so if you haven't, I, I know I invited you to unmute yourselves so we could say hello, but if you could go ahead and mute yourselves again, that would help uh, keep ambient noise down and also uh, strange echo effects. Uh, out of the picture. So I appreciate if you can mute yourself um, or I may mute you for you. <laughs> um, the uh, best way to keep in, in touch with what, everything going on is if you can turn on the chat function on your Zoom. If you don't know how to do that, you just hover your mouse uh, over the bottom part of the screen and then the, you'll see a little icon that looks like a speech bubble. So click on that. Um, and then you'll be able to see the chat appear in the right-hand side of your screen. Um, so if you have uh, a question, once we get our writers talking, you have two options. You can either type in the chat, I have a question, and then I will just MC it and I will say, okay, go ahead, so-and-so, ask your question, and then you could turn your uh, volume back on, unmute yourself and ask your question. Or if you prefer, you can just type your question into the chat and I will read it and um, I will ask it on your behalf. So those are the only instructions. So I think we can get started. So we're going to start tonight with Kevin Spurgaitis. Kevin is a journalist based in Toronto. He has a special interest in public health and ethical issues. Kevin wrote our cover story, I'm sure you've all seen it, um, about Ron Posno's fights to allow advanced requests for medical assistance in dying. So please join me in welcoming Kevin. Thanks, Jocelyn. You can hear me okay? I've, uh, as Jocelyn mentioned, I've been interested in public health and ethical issues for as long as I've been in media, uh, running for newspapers, uh, community-based, uh, regional and national, and magazines, either uh, general interest or uh, justice and ethics focus, such as Broadview and United Church Observer before it. Uh, invariably, whenever I've worked on <clears throat> feature articles uh, concerning ethics, specifically bioethics. I've been asked by editors and sources and subjects themselves if I have any personal connection to, this, to these very same stories. And my answer has always been uh, no, uh, usually not. Since reading though uh, and hearing about people's uh, tragic experiences with illness and the impacts of the deficits in the healthcare system, I've just been drawn towards public health uh, topics and issues. Uh, they're rather universal, although they certainly affect parts of the population differently and of course uh, unequally. Uh, and these topics and, and issues have a great deal of resonance. Uh, but, if, but I would be lying if I said uh, that uh, medical dramas such as MASH and ER after that didn't, didn't inspire me in the least. And I really hope I'm not trivializing there, but I think those, uh, the content in, the, in those shows way back when sort of planted some seeds if you really want to know the roots of all this, my interest in public health. I think that's told Gawande's book, Being Mortal, would have been a more mature answer, though, but that's, those, uh, those influences certainly are there. With the issue of uh, advanced requests in, for MAID until now, uh, that's been uh, peripheral in my life. There are friends of my family who uh, are living with dementia, and although they are not advocating for re revisions to uh, medical assistance in dying legislation themselves, I, I think about them quite a bit. Uh, their experiences at, this, at these stages in their lives partly motivated uh, me to explore the issue of advanced requests further as a researcher and writer. But I'm not proficient in writing in the first person. There are much better writers to do that. Uh, so I didn't pitch and write an essay about advanced requests uh, from 
my own perspective uh, and experiences on the periphery of the individuals I just mentioned. I did propose this feature article though, um, and I propose it for broad view alone, simply because end of life ethics has always been thoroughly and thoughtfully covered by the magazine. I thought coverage of this issue, this topic would be a natural and worthwhile extension of all those stories, uh, whether I researched it or wrote it or someone else did. Um, and I would have looked forward to uh, reading that person's story in broad view as well. Uh, so I was pleased to receive the go ahead from Jocelyn Bell uh, to pursue this story last year. Uh, but what started out as what started out as a relevant uh, story with a really strong news peg, so to speak, uh, became an editorial undertaking significantly affected by uh, the shifting news, the ever shifting news. As I mentioned to Jocelyn and managing editor Kaylee Moore, uh, it suddenly became challenging to keep up with and reflect on the ever changing current events while working on deadline. If uh, if it gave me headaches, I can only imagine uh, how many it created for uh, broad views editors and fact checkers. Um, I'm referring to the Quebec Superior Court striking down the reasonable foreseeable requirement and Quebec government six months to make adjustments. I'm referring to the Trudeau government's acceptance of the ruling and tabling legislation to update Canada's medical assistance and dying law. Uh, just as importantly, there, were, there was the federal government survey on MAID, uh, which attracted more than 300,000 responses in January as report, reported by the magazine. Um, also, secondary and tertiary sources acknowledged in the piece expanded on previously published and recorded comments uh, and frankly contradicted them at times. I won't mention any names, but in fairness, their own thinking around this issue uh, may have been uh, changed especially. Uh, finally, because of the dire need to stay abreast and report on the latest news, I made a, a tough decision during the initial uh, draft to leave out other personal narratives and commentary. Um, when there was an opportunity to include another voice in the piece, uh, both Kaylee and Moore and I decided to uh, decided their story would be too involved and to include in an already complicated story. Um, I also interviewed a Windsor-based woman whose father, who had dementia, took his own life around New Year's 2018, and someone whose mother died slowly and painfully due to complications of, with dementia. On the publishing side. Well, I will say that that said, I was somewhat comforted to know, I was very comforted to know that Judith uh, was going to share her story at Bond Maid and that of her husband Clarence in Broadview. And I took, I look forward to hearing more about that shortly. Um, as she wrote, they gave Clarence uh, what he desperately wanted, the gift of consciously, of conscious parting, something not many uh, terminal patients experience. Uh, that was the refrain, refrain of individuals uh, that I spoke to uh, on deeper background for the article. On the publishing side, Jocelyn, uh, in a previous editorial, spoke uh, incredibly well about the, um, the dilemma of highlighting this particular issue with the backdrop, uh, against the backdrop of the coronavirus, which uh, is gravely affecting the senior population. I'm happy uh, Bravi decided to publish this and other stories despite COVID-19. Activists on both sides of the issue are even more so. Uh, their respective rights continue even now, as do others, as we've seen these past couple of weeks with the marches against racism and police threat brutality. As for uh, what's happened since the story was published, um, I haven't turned off my Google alerts. I am very tempted to do so, but the federal government's review of the uh, original MAID law scheduled this month uh, has been delayed because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And this was acknowledged, of course, in the online version of the article. Since advanced requests will continue to be a key issue, especially in regards to people with Alzheimer's disease and similar conditions, um, Still, that 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 that's, remains to be the, the uh, case. Dementia is probably probably goes without saying is devastating, and as uh, this Canadian population gets older, more people and their loved ones will be affected. Uh, right to right to die activists like Ron Posno, who was featured in the magazine in this story, they've uh, they've continued to argue in their email campaigns and Zoom calls like this uh, that the existing made legis legislation deprives most dementia patients their end of life uh, rights afforded to other Canadians. Uh, made oppo opponents, uh, meanwhile, uh, they may, may be less vocal at this point. Uh, that's given things are, have ostensibly been stalled from a government standpoint. Uh, but disability rights activists uh, and some faith groups uh, are still pushing for more supports and better palliative care for patients in need. And of course, as reported also by the magazine United Church of Canada, General Counsel Executive agreed in May to update the state medical saying executive um, accepted recommendations from the theology and inter church interfaith community that emphasizes principles of free and informed choice. 
Uh, that's all been reported, as I mentioned. Uh, it's called on the, gov the Canadian government not to permit advance requests for made by people whose conditions will eventually take away their power of, in of informed consent. It also appeared uh, to the government, uh, it also appeared to appeal to the government to maintain the criterion of a foreseeable death and stated uh, its support for mature minors uh, to advance, to request made. Uh, but those situations uh, will be judged on a case-to-case -case basis. Uh, there will be much more on all of this uh, in the coming months, for sure, this coming year. Um, and so there will be more uh, as it develops, as they say. Well, we need to, we're going to move along to the questions, but thank you so much for that uh, synopsis and just some thoughts of the background of how we came to this. Um, if you know anybody wants to, I don't see any questions yet, but uh, I can certainly ask a question or two. Um, I, I was wondering about uh, Ron Posno. He's such a passionate advocate. Um, and, you know, he's um, I'm just wondering how you found him. He seems like such an interesting character. And, and how did you balance your sympathy for his cause against, you know, other people feeling differently about this issue? Right. He's been, he fell on my radar. He became, uh, he was quickly on my radar as a result of conversations, uh, Jocelyn, with uh, Dying with Dignity Canada. So that's how I became aware of uh, Rob Posno first. Um, I, later, I later learned that he's been giving uh, interviews over the past six months or so, I'd say as far as back as uh, 2018, summer of 2018, and he spoke very eloquently about this issue. Um, and since writing and researching this article and since the story's been published, he's been giving more interviews. So he's, I think he's becoming more of a name in this, uh, with respect to uh, this, this particular end of life issue. I would think uh, he's becoming higher profile. He became even more so again as I researched the article. Um, I was definitely, uh, I definitely, his, his story certainly resonated with me. I wouldn't have uh, talked to him at great lengths over several interviews in person and over the phone and extensively over email as well. Uh, they resonated with me. I think he spoke, I think he speaks arguably, he speaks the most eloqu eloquently about this issue at this time. And so I was, um, I, it was imperative that I include him in this piece. I wasn't sure if I would lead with him. But uh, he's something uh, I would be remiss if I did not include him in any way, shape, or form. As to how I balanced him with the other sources, uh, I would go as far as saying his story, I would say other stories I've heard were less impactful, but they were no less uh, pert pertinent uh, when I was uh, gathering and curating uh, all the individual narratives and quotes and um, insights uh, around this issue. So I. I certainly had to work a little harder um, not to be so engrossed in his story. I mean, that's a really fair question to ask, but um, hopefully I achieved that. Uh, hopefully the story was as well balanced as I set out to make it. Um, okay, I think uh, Jen Goss has a question. If you, if you want to go ahead and just ask instead of uh, typing, <laughs> then please do. We just need to get you off of mute first. Can you unmute? Okay. Um, yeah, I'm wondering um, if we had advanced um, consent allowed, um, I'm wondering how that would work as far as um, whether or not consent at just before the procedure would be needed. Um, I'm thinking if someone is in a vegetative state and has prior previously said that they wanted to die in exactly those circumstances, um, it would seem that that should be allowed. But how would you balance that against someone being able to change their mind? That's that's what makes this article, this issue, that much more complicated. Um, that balance that balance can be made, as Ron Posno has articulated. That balance can certainly be made at a later stage in one's. Uh, illness in one's, uh, during the progression of uh, one's uh, dementia, it's pretty clear cut in their mind, clear cut in their mind, I would say. But uh, it's, but that's the crux of the matter for the, uh, those who are against, uh, the, those who are very critical of uh, any changes to the uh, made legislation as is. Uh, they feel as though people do, people can change their mind. More importantly, they will argue that they are different people as they're,
speaks to a personhood, it speaks to individualism. They, they again argue that uh, they should have every right to change their mind, but they should also, they also say it might be a foregone conclusion that they will change their mind or they're just no longer that, that same person. So I'm not sure if that answers your question in particular, but it just really makes the story, this issue that much more complicated uh, that uh, given the progressive nature of uh, dementia itself. One thing I'm kind of wondering about is um, I, I think that um, if you gave consent just before the procedure, that would kind of solve the problem of changing one's mind. So in my opinion, um, advanced consent should be allowed. It's just how it's worked that I'm wondering about. You're not alone. <laughs> Um, Kevin, can you still hear? Because I'm having a hard time hearing. Oh, I am. I was just acknowledging uh, yeah. the, the question or the comment. I thought it was more of a comment than a question toward the yeah. end there. Um, it does, this is a gray area for sure when it comes to uh, toward the end of work. Okay, and we have one minute left. And I, I just wondered, uh, you know, the, the um, United Church of Canada recently uh, re released a statement opposing advanced requests. Um, did that surprise you or what was your take on that? It did, it did surprise me given the previous stance, which was my, my characterization of it uh, more centrist. I think it's very, very fair to call it, uh, describe it as centrist. So I was quite surprised that Jocelyn, you were the one who alerted me to that. I had yet to uh, receive any news uh, through Google and sources have not, uh, had not come back to me either. I thought for sure Ron Posno who uh, emails uh, me and others uh, almost daily, I thought for sure that would, have, uh, that would have been brought to my attention by him. I was surprised by that. Uh, it's definitely more clear cut than it has uh, previously. Where they go with it uh, next is certainly a big question mark for me. I wonder, I've read the news thread, the Facebook news thread, the comment thread, I've seen or read the, the feedback and it's, uh, it's not surprisingly, not surprisingly very mixed, uh, but there's, my surprise is certainly shared by, I would say, a great number of people within the United Church of Canada. And again, that's reflected in the Facebook feed. But I was surprised. I, um, yeah, I would certainly, it would certainly affect somewhat certain sections of the article if it was written today. Yeah. Okay, uh, we're going to move along. Thank you so much, Kevin. That was excellent. Thank uh, you, Joseph. I'm going to go to um, the Judith. Um, Judith is coming to us by phone. So, Judith, are you there? Let's see if Judith has made it. I think she may have, you know what, she may have called me a minute ago. Um, so, I think she might be having a hard time getting online. So, I'll, I'll deal with that in a moment. And now we're going to skip ahead then. Um, and sorry, I, if she wants to call me back, if she can hear me, then that's great. If, but I did see a, a phone call and I turned it off because I didn't want to be disturbed. Um, what about Mike Alexander? Mike, are you here? Mike Alexander, not here yet. Hi. Oh, you're here. Hello, Mike. Nice to see you. Hi there. Okay, Mike Alexander is an artist who works primarily with acrylic paint but recently completed his first graphic novel. He's originally from Swan Lake First Nation and he's joining us tonight from his home in Kamloops, BC. Mike is, Mike is an Anishinaabe 60s scoop survivor and he wrote and illustrated a poignant graphic novella for our June issue called The Road Home. So over to you, Mike. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me and um, I hope everyone's doing uh, all right today. Um, I can um, sort of speak to some of the background, uh, what led to the creation of uh, the little vignette that I created for uh, Broadview. And it was, uh, it was really special to be able to do so, um, you know, being asked to, to do something nice and succinct that um, allowed me to kind of tell a story that, is, you know, is uh, going um, for me these days. Um, and, you know, I'm, 
happy to report that uh, things are pretty good. You know, things are okay. Things are manageable um, a lot of the time. And um, it's just kind of a continuation of, of a journey that I feel like I started um, some time ago. Um, what I encounter a lot of time, I guess, in my travels is sort of questions about uh, the nature of the 60s scoop. Um, and, you know, I learned an awful lot about it within the last couple of years myself. I'm not by any stretch of the imagination an expert in um, understanding it um, other than maybe through lived experience. And a lot of that lived experience, you know, involved an awful lot of denial and an awful lot of um, just kind of fear and isolation and um, all of the components that kind of come from uh, living, you know, completely separate uh, from my community, um, never knowing, you know, my biological family and um, never having access to, to my own language, uh, to my Ojibwe language. And, you know, what I'm reading about these days is that that kind of severing, um, it incurs tr trauma into a young mind. Um, for me, you know, I felt um, for a long time that I had been rejected uh, by my parents, uh, rejected by my community, you know, that I was just this guy living in a non-native home. And, you know, I love my mom and, you know, I feel like I have given an awful lot of opportunities um, living in, you know, Winnipeg um, when I did. Uh, for 40 years, um, you know, I had good things going on, which made sort of the depression kind of hard to understand. It made, uh, you know, the slide into alcoholism just seem like, oh, this is what I like to do. This is just kind of a little bit of who I am, but I'm not an addict. Um, but, you know, the nature of trauma that people live with as a result of surviving the 60s scoop uh, can really push uh, people to to desperate sort of um, situations. You know, um, the when we talk about uh, the suicide crisis, um, that's a real thing. You know, it's as real as when we talk about how um, you know dozens of reserves don't have drinking water in Canada. Um, why the justice system is the way that it is with over 30% of the population being indigenous. Uh, why the, you know, this is the 60s scoop is a byproduct of the child welfare system. The racist, you know, notion that, you know, native kids need to be saved from, from themselves and that perhaps we can beat the, the, the Indian out of the child. Um, it kind of left me in a place where you know, I tried to drink myself to death. When that didn't work, I, you know, tried um, to have an overdose. Um, and at that point, you know, when you wake up and you've hit rock bottom and you have to admit that life isn't working um, and you need to start over, you know, there has to be some hope. There has to be the ability to find something to cling to. And, you know, I, in learning to become a triathlete, I've I've met other triathletes who have not the same story, but who have a similar experience in overcoming hardship through endurance sport. And this is something that I've really been uh, very excited about in my life. Um, I'm privileged to be able to access, you know, um, stuff that I need. I'm privileged to be able to articulate myself through art and you know, these two things really sort of focus on the mental, spiritual, and the, the physical for me, because it's my understanding of the, the medicine wheel and the grandfather teachings that, you know, um, these are ways that health can be found within the nation, as well as within the indiv individual and, and the family as well. So I'm just kind of on this healing journey, and, and uh, you know, the, the work that I did for Broadview with Broadview um, is just kind of a way to document um, a little bit, just a couple of snapshots about how it's been going for me so far. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, uh, we have one question from Faye Moffat that I'll read. I'm wondering if Mr. Alexander would give 
permission to United Churches to make use of his graphic novel in Broadview in online services on June 21st, Indigenous Day of Prayer. We would acknowledge and make a donation to an organization of his choice. Do you want to consider that? And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, big that, ask. Yeah. That sounds good to me. Yeah. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't believe we've put it online yet, but I'm not sure. I'll have to check and see what our plan is for uh, including that online. Um, we've got someone else saying, "I too am a 60 scoop child." So there you are. There, yeah. There was. There's been. Um, international sure. gatherings um or i guess not national but regional gatherings that you know for the first time in my life you know there's one in vancouver i attended where like 400 scoobies were there um and it was just us you know with the the organize the organization i was hosting it i have never been in a room with that many people who have such a familiar story you know, and I, I think part of the problem with the 60s scoop is that we felt so isolated. We didn't know that there were others like us. And so when we find other survivors, when we get to meet people who have a terribly familiar, sad sort of journey, it's a really transformative experience to just, wow, you, you, there's, you can talk all night long, but you can also not even say all that much and feel like, no, this person totally gets my experience. This person totally understands what it's like to sort of overcome challenges that we never had any choice about. Um, yeah. And so to hear, you know, that there's folks tuning in that um, understand, um, you know, in their, their own way what that means is, is really important. Mike, what did you think, what, how do you feel about the form that we chose, which was a graphic novel, to share this, um, this story of yours? And, you know, yeah, I guess I'm just wondering what, what you think of that as a, as a form for telling stories. It was a bit of a first time for us. Yeah, um, I think it's, it, it's really interesting. You know, I, I spend a lot of time doing um, acrylic paintings, um, getting them into galleries, uh, selling them. Um, and just kind of feeling really good about exploring Anishinaabe culture in a very traditional kind of a way, which is important. But, you know, I, I grew up on comics. I have read many comics. I feel like it's a really great format that promotes literacy, that promotes this really artistic kind of way of, of telling a, a really good, solid story. So... I mean, I can think of all sorts of magazines that I've seen that had, you know, comics kind of throughout them. And those create such an impact for the person just kind of casually leafing through. Um, it's great to be able to sort of draw them in through this um, feast for the eyes and, and for the senses and hopefully for, for that person's intellect. Yeah. Um, it's great. That's one of the things I loved about your story is that you were able to capture it and just, it was, you know, in a way it's simple, but you can just understand there's so much complexity behind each of the frames that you gave us and uh, so much depth of thought behind each one too. So um, yeah, maybe we'll, we'll try it again sometime. Absolutely. And I recommend everybody look up Mike Alexander's artwork. It's just stunning. Uh, what's your website, Mike? Uh, thundercloud.designs.org. Okay, thundercloud. If you want to type it into the chat, that might be helpful for people. Oh, and uh, everyone check it out. <laughs> um, okay, thank you so much. That was uh, wonderful to hear from you. We're going to... Um, yes, somebody... Oh, sorry, I just have to read this out loud. I, I would affirm this format of Mr. Alexander Spillett communicating through this. Please keep writing. Okay, wonderful. Um, so we do have uh, Judith back on the line and Judith are you there I'm told that she's here Sharon do you know if she's here oh there you are hello <laughs> okay so you're on mute just a second we're going to unmute you um, maybe you have to unmute yourself I don't know why it's not. now. Okay. Now can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. I'm going, to I'm going to introduce you quickly, and then we're going to turn it over to you. We'll go back to the uh, topic of made. All right. 
Uh, so Judith Pedersen has been a teacher and an entrepreneur. At her website, judithpedersen.com, she writes two blogs, This Northern Life and The Writer's Apprentice. In our June issue, she shared her last day with her husband, Clarence, before his medically assisted death. Judith is uh, here tonight from Flin Flon, Manitoba. So please take it away, Judith. Thanks very much. Um, I wrote the essay about uh, the morning my husband died, months after it happened, but I couldn't tell you exactly when that was because, um, you know, for a while after someone dies that you love, everything's a blur. And probably many of you already know this. You kind of wander around in a complete fog and sometimes you end up in the kitchen with a pound of butter in your hand and you think, what am I doing here? What was I, what was I going to do? And I, I think I wrote the essay because of the fog, because I didn't want to forget the de details of that morning. You know, I wanted to honor the decision that my husband made and, and also the sacrifice that our family made in supporting him because that date really did loom over us. And I wondered if people would see medically assisted death as, as an easy way out or even an act of cowardice because really I know that it takes courage to pick a day to die for the person who's dying and also for their family. And I didn't want to forget the details about March 18th or March 28th, I'm sorry, 2018 and how we spent our last morning. Um, I also wrote the essay as a way of dealing with the after effects of my husband's death because here's the crazy thing. I saw him die along with my family. I saw our family friend who is the local funeral director come to our house and pick up his body. And yet, after a few weeks, it felt to me like he'd vanished, like he just vanished from the earth. And um, I had to keep reminding myself, he didn't vanish. I saw him die. He had a compassionate, awake, loving exit from the world. And I needed to remind myself about that. And I also wanted to honor the MAID program, which felt like such a gift, you know, from Canada to us personally. And I, I had a friend just die in Switzerland, and believe me, it is not a picnic. It was a real effort. So uh, my children didn't read the essay until, actually, until uh, everyone else did. In fact, I think, as far as I know, as far as I can remember, I think Jocelyn Bell was the first one to read it. Um, I was digging through documents on my computer in December, and I came across the essay. And suddenly I felt as if I was stretched out on the floor and there was a heavy weight on my chest. And I, I just felt so burdened. And I thought, I, I've got to get this out of here. And um, I looked at the table and there was my Broadview magazine, which I'd been reading at breakfast. And I thought, I know, I know what I'll do. I'll send it to Broadview because those people seem really nice. This was, this was my very simplistic thinking at that time. I had to get it away from me. I had to send it. I had to share my story and I had to trust someone to read it. So I sent it off to her and I just said, you know, you don't have to write back. You don't have to do anything. I just, just, I would appreciate if, if one of you would read it. And I knew they would. I just knew it. So anyway, I was completely surprised when Jocelyn got in touch with me and said, you know, we're doing a story on Made and we would like to publish your essay as well. And I was really surprised because I don't, many of you might not know this, but they have fairly high standards at uh, Broadview magazine. So anyway, I said yes. And um, I wondered how I'd feel when it came out, to be honest. Uh, I didn't get my paper copy for a few weeks, but when the, um, when the web version came out, I put a link on my website and on my Facebook author page. And then I was completely surprised because I could not believe how many people got in touch with me. Uh, complete strangers who obviously knew me, but I didn't know them stopped me on the street to talk about it. And, uh, and the thing that surprised me was that for most of them, it wasn't how he died. that was the part that got them. It was our love story which surprised me because I thought everybody would have an opinion about MAID and people were completely comfortable with that part. And in fact, um, I would get texts from people around Canada. I think one person worked with MAID who was interested to hear the family's point of view. And um, just 
a doctor, a nurse, just and then just complete strangers would text me, would find me on uh, Facebook and then send me a message. And so it, it seemed to resonate with people. And I think it was partly because other people have grieved over loved ones and other people have love stories that have ended. So anyway, I, I think that's a big part of it. Um, and I think the thing that surprised me the most was how light I felt after the essay was published and people started getting in touch with me. I didn't expect that. I felt every single person that talked to me or sent me a text, I felt lighter. So I know it sounds strange, but I also believe that the impulse, which was, I have to tell you, very strong. Uh, when I first decided to just write to Jocelyn, it was a very strong impulse to send it to her. And I believe it was a spiritual decision. And I'm glad I made it. Well, we're very glad you did too. And the first time I read it, I, I completely teared up and I felt like I knew Clarence. I felt like I was right there with you and I shared it with several colleagues and everyone had the same reaction. And so we just knew we had to share this with the, our readers. Um, the, the writing was fairly short and succinct. I mean, you know, you've got an entire lifetime of a love story. And I, I wondered if there were other parts of that day that you weren't able to include in your story, just, you know, for the sake of, you know, right. There there were, there were, there were um, little funny things that happened. Actually, just before my husband died, there was two particularly things that are kind of sweet. He was a very quirky, interesting guy. And I actually have written about him on my, on my blogs a few times because he was very funny. But uh, 20 years ago, he bought a, um, a marble bowl in Mexico and he was so proud of it. And he just loved it. And one day, one of the years got knocked off and he could never find out who did it. So he's ready to die and the people are around us and it's there's just this atmosphere of love and all of a sudden he holds up his hand and says stop he said i just have to ask one last time no worries no anger who who knocked off the ear to the bull and we all just started laughing <laughs> we said it had to be a niece or a nephew because it wasn't us and he was like okay 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 and then, and then he was ready to go and the doctor was ready. Oh, and then he said one more thing. We'd had a soundtrack running in the background. We'd had the, you know, Pat Stevens greatest hits. And he put up his hand again. He said, now, don't let this ruin Cat Stevens for you. Okay, promise me. We were all like, no, we won't let it ruin Cat Stevens worse than we didn't. But anyway, I, we just kind of love that, how he had the ability to kind of make us chuckle right to the very end. So that was kind of sweet. Yeah. Um, I'll, if there's any other questions, just uh, jump in. Otherwise, I will. Uh, I, I do have another question. I wondered if you were thinking, you know, made it such a huge issue in Canada, if you were thinking about um, being part of a bigger national dialogue on this issue by sharing your story, if that wasn't really part of the impulse as much. I think so. I, I was um, touched by the article about Ron Posno. Is that his last name? Um, because my friends and I have talked a lot about this since Clarence passed and and we've all decided that we would rather not sit in a nursing home with dementia not knowing our families not being able to take care of ourselves and and uh, I know so many people and I think baby boomers feel a little stronger stronger about this maybe maybe we're not as tough or maybe we just feel we have more rights I don't know what it is but but I feel like I should have a say in how much suffering I do in my life, right? I mean, it's not like, I don't know. Anyway, so so there's a lot of people talking about it in our town. Clarence was the first person to die with the MAID program. So it's really started a conversation here in Plymouth Lawn. Hmm. And you, uh, oh, we've got a, we've got a uh, question here from Daryl Rainey. I know how to pronounce your name. Uh, what would you say to families whose, whose loved ones are thinking about MAID? I would say that it, it's really got to be the person who's who's ill or you know needs the made program who makes the decision nobody else can make the decision um they have to really want that um and it is it is not an easy thing for the family because we we picked a date you can call made you know and say oh my goodness things are worse we need you to come and and if other people have booked them then you have to wait and clarence did not want to have that he wanted to know that they were going to be there and he could count on that so he picked March 28th um, and uh, I would say if you can pick a date it makes it easier for the MAID team um, 
everyone lives because we have an especially wonderful program here. Uh, and I would also say to the family that it's a little harder than you might think, because even though it's wonderful that everyone gets to come and say goodbye, which we had a big family party two nights before with like 40 people and there's so many good things about it. But I think there's also something to be said for the boring, you know, days of waiting at the hospital while somebody slowly drifts off. So, so there's that too. That's in some ways, I think that's easier, but in hindsight, I mean, it was, it's all about what that person wants. And my husband really wanted this. And so we supported that and we're, we're glad he had that. We're glad we had, and we're glad we had the lovely maid team that we did. It was really wonderful. Yeah. If you can say that. <laughs> yeah. Um, was there, uh, I mean, before, before your husband Clarence had cancer, uh, is it something that you had talked about previously? Um, like, did you have a strong opinion about it? going back? Uh, well, um, we, we'd heard, you know, we'd heard discussions about it on CBC radio and we talked about it. And we both, we both had always agreed with it. We like, you know, we're both Christians. We both go to the United church and we both believe that my husband, my husband would have died in his forties. If, um, if we didn't believe in modern medicine, if he didn't take blood pressure pills, he would have died. I mean, his, he had a real blood pressure problem and and so we just both believe that you know if you're going to have medical intervention to save your life why can't you have medical intervention to end your life you know when your life is not going well you know when you've mm -hmm. reached that point where you're really suffering or or you're really old and you're what about if you're 95 and you're doing great but you just think you know what my friends are gone i don't have anybody I think I'm done. Why, why shouldn't we have the right to say that? Yeah. I don't, in my opinion. Thank you so much, Jude. We're going we're to leave it there. And we're going to move along to Allison. Uh, so Allison Roberts McEwen spent the first part of her career as a lecturer and researcher in ethics and human rights. She received her call to ministry in 2014 and has successfully grown two congregation, congregations since then. She is passionate about evangelism and church growth. And in our June issue, she wrote about the 300 plus United Church congregations that are growing and what they're doing right. So please join me in welcoming Allison. Hello, thanks. Um, so uh, Jocelyn had asked me to say a couple of words about uh, how I came to this research uh, in the first place. So it, it actually is a program requirement of our uh, MDiv program at the Atlantic School of Theology to do a final um, grad research project in our last year. And when I worked in academia, one of the areas that I worked in actually was research ethics. Um, and I became very firmly convinced that about 70% of the research that was being done didn't need to be done, and it benefited no one but the researcher. And so I was very adamant that whatever research I did for this grad project had better benefit somebody other than me. So I actually had two topics that I was um, debating. Uh, the first was actually called over accountability and stress and the vocational process for candidates for ministry. So it focused on some very negative experiences of seminarians going through vocational development. Um, and, and the idea that I had with respect to that particular topic was um, to make some recommendations to candidacy boards um, about how I might improve that process. But of course, that was at the time that our governance structure was changing, we were, the whole educational process was changing, and so it wasn't entirely clear whether the same, um, same feelings would apply or the same rules would apply. Um, I also felt that um, if I was going to spend, you know, a really long time immersed in something, I wasn't sure that I wanted it to be something that, that was, um, you know, emotionally pretty draining, which, which hearing a lot of these stories could be. So the other research was um, about congregational growth. Um, so I thought, well, you know, I, I didn't, uh, didn't want to put students at greater risk by, by engaging those, those very difficult stories of theirs. And I really wanted to focus on something positive. 
And so I, I decided that I would do my uh, graduate research on um, congregational growth. At AST, we have a five-year um, placement in congregations, which is a bit different than some other programs. Um, other programs are either one or two years of internship. We're actually placed in congregations for five years, and we fully participate in the life of the church um, during that time. So as I was, you know, suddenly going to presbytery meetings and conference meetings and things like that, I have to say that I was really shocked by the negative talk in the church. My local presbytery had a regular session that was called Good News Stories, and it was always about what they called courageous conversations about closing churches. So the good news stories were about closing churches and what we're going to do with the money, or maybe we amalgamated, and maybe we amalgamated with someone outside of the denomination, and things like that. Not once was a good news story about congregational growth. And I, I thought, well, why is nobody telling me? And, and I knew that there were congregations out there that were growing because I'd been part of two. And so I thought, well, let, let's start thinking about telling those stories. So I think that part of the reason that, um, that, that this negative talk happens is because there seemed to be this pervasive belief that there aren't any churches growing in the United Church of Canada. Or that if there are, there might be one or two and there are anomalies and, you know, but that we really can't, there's nothing to be learned here. And, and I mentioned in the article that, you know, the most common when I said that I was going to do research on congregations was, well, that shouldn't take you long. <laughs> you know, that there's not a lot of people, you, you won't have a lot of interviews. It won't take you very long. But as, as you learn from the article, that's, that's absolutely not the case. And I think that that has affected how we do church. We, we are operating in this context of providing palliative care to dying congregations rather than focusing on growth and the attempt to grow churches. One of the things that people were initially critical of in the research was the focus on growth rather than spiritual wellness or something along those lines. And I certainly am the first person to agree that there's far more to congregational wellness than bums in seats. But I also think we're afraid to talk about bums in seats because we think it can't happen. And, and we also, I, I think that, you know, the size of our congregations and our ability to grow congregations actually is a pretty good barometer of how our congregations are doing spiritually. When people tell me that, um, that their congregation is different, <laughs> and so it's impossible to grow their congregation, I ask them what they've done. And they sort of sheepishly say, well, nothing. And I sort of say, well, and that's not working for you, so <laughs> you're doing nothing, and you're expecting change. Well, you know, there, there's a problem with this. You can't keep doing the same old things and expect different results. So at the very least, to try something. So I started to reflect in a more systematic way about what my congregations and I had done in order to facilitate growth. And it had to do with many of the things that you've read about in the article. We prayed, we listened to the movement of the Holy Spirit, we were intentional about growth, we were intentional about welcome, we were intentional about appropriate and respectful change, and we were invitational. So when I began the research, I then reached out to other ministers who had led growing congregations. And many of them, like me, hadn't, hadn't done it in a really strategic or systematic way, but they just courageously went where the Spirit led them and, and where, where their congregations felt like they were moving. And I just have to have a, a shout out to the participants who participate in the research because these are the best people to talk to ever. <laughs> they are just, they, this is a group of clergy who are absolutely on fire. They are passionate. They, they are in absolute love with their faith, love with their congregations, and, and they are passionate about church growth and evangelism. They, they are absolutely inspiring. And um, they actually they actually pushed me to say, you know, can we keep this group together? We need a, a growing congregation summit 
And so that actually is going to be the, the next sort of follow-up step in, the, in this project. Well, that's exciting. Well, let, please do let us know when that's happening. And uh, I'm sure we'd love to cover it. <laughs> Were you surprised to find as many growing churches? Like, did you think people thought, oh, one or two, you'll, your research will be done in a heartbeat? Um, what number did you think you would find? I, I thought it would be, I figured around 10%. I was surprised that it was more than 10%. Okay. Um, so so I, I, I thought that it was probably more than, um, than most people did, but I, I didn't expect that it was going to be up around 14%. Well, I mean, 16% if, if we take in amalgamation. So amalgamation was the issue. It was a question of, um, you know, ha have these congregations grown as a result of amalgamation or what I call silent amalgamation, which is you've got a bunch of other churches closing around you. And so your, your congregation grows. And, and, you know, so, so the ones that were focused on in the research were ones that that didn't apply to. So. Okay. Uh, and I wonder too, how, you know, you talked about the, the ministers that you talked to and how wonderful, because they're so on fire and passionate. How much of growth really rides on the minister and how much do you think rides on the congregation or is it just both? Yeah, it really is both. I, and it was, I think that that came out in um, the question that I asked about, um, is there ever a congregation that can't grow? And they were very, I mean, because they are so optimistic and, and you know, such a, such a passionate group, they didn't really want to write off any congregation. But the reality is that there are congregations who have toxic politics, and they're not going to grow until that's sorted out. And so whether that means, I mean, that might mean leadership, it might mean intention, intentional interim leadership, you know, it, it might just means, it might mean some departures. <laughs> um, so, so that definitely was a situation in which, you know, pe people just, you're not going to grow a congregation. But yeah. the other thing is, I think also that um, people have to be open you know, the congregation has to be open to the change. And, and certainly in the congregation that I'm in now in Coketown, I, I didn't anticipate moving as quickly as we did. Um, I, I was very much of the mind that we're going to, I'm going to sit there for a year, get the lay of the land. I'm going to, you know, le learn about the congregation and the community and, um, and wait before trying to implement any change. And, and, you know, that was not how it happened. It ha happened actually within four months. Within four months, we started on, on our journey. <laughs> um, there's a question here from Daryl Rainey. Uh, was the growth found in the progressive churches or was there some in the traditional church as in the traditional church as well? That was one thing that we explored when we were working on your piece together. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there is um, this, uh, idea and and it, it's it comes from other research that um that um you know that certain <laughs> kinds of theology um tend to be more prevalent in growing churches or certain kinds of music tend to be prevalent in in growing churches and it's actually not the case um you know i mean the, the church that that uh, my my congregation is in rural ontario and and you know, I mean, we're, we're, when I got there, you know, it, it's funny because when I, when I got to Cope Town, we had, believe it or not, a harpsichord and an organ. <laughs> and now we have a sandbox and a drum kit and a keyboard in the sanctuary. So yeah, there's been transition, but we still use a lot of traditional music. And I think part of it has to do with um, knowing what the congregation values and and understanding that my congregation doesn't want a service where scripture's not read, you know my congregation doesn't want a service where we don't say the Lord's prayer and so I value those things with them, you know and and so yeah we don't we don't abandon those things including when we do really bizarre things like we just we actually had just um, Elvis Pentecost <laughs> two weeks ago so you know. Okay. But we still had our scripture and we still had the Lord's Prayer and you just, you, you've got to know what's, what's important to folks, I think. Uh, Emma has a question. So go ahead, Emma. Yes. So interesting timing for us to post your piece just at a time when 
traditional ministry is kind of upended for a lot of congregations and they're looking to find new ways to reach people and, and stay connected with folks who are already coming. Do you think this is an opportunity for churches to grow or are there dangers in terms of losing people? Both. <laughs> so, so I think that, um, I, I think that, you know, people are missing, um, you know, they're, they're missing being together, they're missing community. And, and, you know, certainly part of our definition as church has to do with gathering in, in presence with each other, you know. Um, and yes, yeah, Zoom creates a kind of presence, but it's, we know that it's not the same kind of presence. So, um, so I, I think that there is a potential for problems there. It's interesting that many churches are telling me that they're growing during this time. And, and, and people have asked me to speculate why. And I think one of the reasons is because they are actively doing the work to make sure that they stay together. They're actively doing all of those things that they kind of should be doing all the time anyway, in terms of being invitational, trying to be creative, being invitational, making sure that you know, you're know you doing that outreach all the time. I mean, long before COVID, I sent you know, Christmas and Easter cards to my entire congregation all the time. You know, I phone people if, if I don't see them for a couple of weeks. And, and I think that now people are doing that, that kind of stuff more. I think also it's, more, it's very convenient to, you know, be in your yoga pants and, <laughs> and click online on Sunday morning as opposed to uh, having to, you know, go anywhere. And, you know, and let's not underestimate the power of boredom, but, <laughs> you know, but I think whatever, whatever's happening, I think that, you know, you tap into it. And I think as, as a leader, that's what you do is you, you learn to tap into it. And, um, and I, th and I think in my experience with my congregation is that they, very much get on board with that and and they also do the work of inviting other people so. allison uh there's a few more questions um so i'm going to just uh give you about one minute and then i'm going to wrap up for anybody who wants uh to get going but um you know zoom can keep on going if you want to stay and chat for a little while with our writers if our writers are willing to do that um, the conversation can continue for a while and that's just fine. But I just want to wrap up so that those who want to get going can go. Um, so quickly, Alison, what is the most important attribute that a church needs to cultivate when they wish to grow? I would just say healthy internal politics. Yeah, you, you just, you need to get your own house in order. Like you really do. And, and you know, there, there can't be any power pockets within the congregation. There can't be, you know, what we traditionally have called matriarchs and patriarchs or power families and things like that. I mean, it, it, it has to be an egalitarian group and, and that kind of power politics has got to go. Okay. Well, uh, that brings us to our the end of our program. Um, thank you so much to all of you for being here tonight. Thank you especially to Kevin and Judith and Mike and Allison who volunteered their time to make this event possible. So we are so very grateful to all four of you. Um, tomorrow we'll be sending you a short survey by email so you can share your thoughts with us about this event. Uh, Broadview's online reading club is a free event and the costs to produce it are minimal. However, if you'd like to help Broadview continue to hire wonderful writers and journalists like Kevin, Judith, Mike, and Allison, please consider making a small donation of five or $10 to our friends fund. You can go to broadview.org slash donate. Uh, we can put that link up, perhaps Sharon, into the chat. Um, and there will also be a donations link attached to tomorrow's survey for your convenience. Broadview Reading Clubs exist across Canada and we've just heard of a few more tonight. If you're interested in joining a local club or starting one of your own, please check out our information pages at broadview.org slash reading clubs. Um, and that's all. So thank you again and be well. And I hope to see you again next month. Good night. Thanks, Jocelyn. Thanks. But I'll be sticking around for a few minutes. If anybody wants to ask another question, there's some on the, on the board. If anybody wants to keep going, that's okay. I was going to mention some of the one word things. I'd like to just uh, tell you a little bit about our meeting today in Kelowna. I asked the group to think of uh, uh, a word that might describe their impressions having read the issue. 
and talked about it for about an hour and a half. And around the uh, 10 people, we had words like thought provoking, challenging, a blur. Um, one person thought it seemed a bit scattered, I think meaning that it was a variety of issues, all needing uh, quite a bit of uh, serious thought. So it was, I feel, one of the uh, top uh, issues that we've had lately, and I really appreciate the writers and the artistry um, that we saw and we are really excited about the future. We hope, Broadview, that you will keep going. Uh, more power to you. Take Thank care. You. Thanks so much. Um, so if you have another, if you have a question or a comment, maybe just um, so I don't have to keep emceeing, just, you know, jump in, turn your, turn your voice, your mute off, I guess, uh, and just go ahead. There's a few there. Um, but I just invite you to just, you know, think of it as the coffee hour after the event and just jump on in. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say that I found Allison's uh, talk and, and article very encouraging as a member of the United Church. It just made me feel, it's almost like I needed that to flip something in my brain to say, wow, like growth, what a thought. <laughs> when, I, when I joined the United Church in 1998, we had to put chairs down the aisle. It was so packed. We had so many children in Sunday school. I mean, you had to get there early. You couldn't get a seat. And um, yeah, so that's encouraging. I, yeah, we're, I think we're gonna have a meeting about this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I've actually had that in both of my congregations. I, we, we've actually um, had the problem uh, in, in the first one where, you know, <laughs> the chair of the property committee came up to me afterwards and he says, we don't we don't have enough tables set up for coffee hour after and i was like great problem right <laughs> and he was like oh <laughs> well yeah. yes i guess it is yeah. and yeah. and you know our our last um you know in in copetown you know when i got there i think they they told me that the most people that they'd had in recent memory for christmas eve was 44 or something like that <laughs> and last christmas we had 123 wow and and we're wondering about lighting live candles <laughs> you know so so like great problems to have like when you're worrying about the safety issues of the number of people in the building that's a really yeah. great thing so. yeah exactly well with christmas eve we had we had, had the response was hmm, we need to go back to two services oh wow. great it's a, it's, a, it's a little church and there wasn't it wasn't really enough space there were people out in the foyer all over the place huh. yeah great i was going to just um pop in and say that i hope you can um feature more art and more writing from mike maybe on a monthly basis i don't know it was really exceptional and i was part of the book group that um francis was just talking about so we're in Kelowna. so shout out to mike who's our neighbor um it was amazing and everybody in the group really responded to it well and we just thought it was such a like nice departure for broadview like something so different and yeah. um at the same while same time so challenging and provoke thought provoking and uh so just <laughs> blessings and thank you so much for that Thank you. Yeah. Well, since we since we published that piece, we've had a few pitches from other uh, graphic novelists. Um, just you know, people see that we're doing it, so they're going to start to come after that. So, but yeah, Mike's uh, Mike's fantastic. I don't know if he's still on the line, but yeah. singing his praises regardless. Hi, Mike. <laughs> There's um. I mean, I can think of all my favorite you know comic strips that I grew up with in the the daily newspaper kind of thing and. You really started to have, you know, almost personal relationships with people like Garfield and, and I don't know, Kathy or whoever. <laughs> but, you know, it sort of be, kind of developed these, there's, there's a connection that kind of can happen when it comes to narrative art, I think. Um, if an artist is willing to kind of, you know, be honest with what makes them funny or what makes them laugh or, or what makes them sort of feel in, inspired. Um, so. 
and if it's if that's what happens then that's you know that seems like a success so that, that means that an artist is actually having an impact on an audience so um yeah I, it's kind of what i feel like i've seen and i, I want to say kevin uh i'm sorry that i wasn't here to hear your talk because i didn't get the invite and so then sharon sent it to me later and i so i missed you but i I'm sorry about that because I really enjoyed the article. So, Thank you. yeah, it was very, really, really interesting to read in, in light of my experience too. And I, 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 appreciate, I appreciate your uh, narrative. I, um, I was really comforted to know that it was included in the piece, included in the magazine, uh, that it would be a companion piece, or the piece, the piece that I wrote would be a yeah. companion to yours. Um, it was important to have uh, to have that uh, added perspective. Uh, just given the ever-changing news, as I acknowledged, and uh, just the sheer number of sources that could be potentially included in the piece, right. it was just, uh, it's just, it was just impossible to include all perspectives and unique perspectives. So I was really comforted to know that you, you were able to write and to have your piece published in Broadview. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Did you, Josh, I was the Josh. one that was supposed to send that email. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, that, that, that's okay. I just, I thought, did I get, I was checking oh, yeah. the date. I thought, did I get the date wrong? Uh, no, I just, you, when you said that, I was like, oh, right. So anyway, sorry about that. Uh, Jocelyn, are you going to, um, uh, you've recorded this uh, often. It, it, it's available again for watching if people want to. Are you going to do that? Yeah, I think that's the plan. We haven't really uh, talked it all through yet. And, you know, if we just share it uh, on our website or put it on the, maybe put it on the reading club pages or something like that. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, we've recorded it so that we can share it in some fashion. And is this One a closed other. group? Like, do other people get to join or are you just... Right now, we are only promoting it through our e-newsletter, kind of as a okay. you know sign up for the e-newsletter insiders right. type of thing. Oh. Uh, the Zoom account that we have can only handle 100 people, but we could always upgrade if needed. Okay. <laughs> so we haven't um, we haven't good advertised. Good problem to have. It. <laughs> yeah, no, good problem to have. So yeah, we just wanted to get a few under our belt and get a feel for them first. Okay. Yeah. Make sure. Uh, one good. one thing to just suggest uh, it hadn't men hadn't been mentioned anywhere else. Um, uh, I belong to a, a Facebook group called uh, uh, Death Cafe, um, and um, it's and we have a virtual one in Edmonton. Uh, is is called Death uh, a Virtual Death Cafe. So we're using Zoom uh, to have our our chats. We like we have been meeting for a couple of years now. It's a worldwide movement. This thing called Death Cafe, and. Uh, but uh, we were meeting in a restaurant, and, and then of course we couldn't in March. So um, so now it's online. And uh, so if you're in, if you're curious, um, uh, there's Death Cafe chats on in different si cities and all over the world. So it, it'll be well, not necessarily Edmonton, but all over Canada too. And that's where you talk about end of life issues, and yes, decisions, it's, it's, and just face the reality that we're all going to go that kind of thing. It, it's it's a its purpose is is uh, was started to to try and engage in a positive uh, uh, light of end of life uh, management decisions and and issues and stuff like that. And it started in the UK and it's all over the world now. Um, but uh, it, it it was it's designed to give a, a forum for people to talk about you know the death of or end of life management they call it. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to start in the UK because that's where my friend Crispin uh, lived and in August he went to Switzerland to last August to end his life and it's very different there than Canada because he he had uh, um, ALS and he had to go before he was really ready to go because he had to do it himself. He had to have a drink and he had to be able to drink the whole thing and he had to be able to hold it and nobody else could do it for him and there was nobody with him and his family they were just given this drink and then left alone. And so I was, I, he and his wife and I have been talking about it and, and she's really hoping that Great Britain will, will end up with a, a made program because she said it was, the whole thing was fraught. Even planning to go, they couldn't let anyone know in case they got stopped. So, you know, when you hear stories like that, I, you just feel like we are blessed to be here in Canada and have this in place. Mm -hmm. Even as much as we've got now, even though we maybe want a little more added. 
Uh, yeah, just just Google uh, oh. Death Cafe. Um, well, that's all you, you need to do to, to find it. So. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay. Write everything down. Well, hi, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thanks very much, folks. Thanks. I think I'm going to uh, say goodnight as well. So thank you again for being here and um, have a wonderful evening. Take care. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.